welcome to this edition of the 700 Club. We have a, well, an uh, impaired president in charge of this nation. Uh, he calls uh, the vice president, President Harris. Uh, he forgets the name of his uh, uh, defense secretary and where he's located. He forgets the place called the Pentagon. And so the nations around the world are saying America is in crisis and we are going to take advantage of it. Vladimir Putin is challenging our president to an online debate after Biden called him a killer. China is launching repeated cyber attacks against U.S. computer systems, and its military is encroaching into the South China Sea while carrying out threatening flyovers over Taiwan. North Korea is restarting its nuclear weapons program, and Iran is once again enriching uranium to build nuclear weapons. And the question we have to ask ourselves today, is our president strong enough to handle these explosive issues? And my answer to that, unfortunately, is no, he's not. And they realize it, and our enemies are going to go after us in all fours. As I recall, the head of the FBI said about every t 10 hours, there is another attempt of, uh, of cyber espionage coming out of China. You see, if they can cut off our power grid, if they can disable our uh, internet system, they could cripple us, and they know that. But they also know that if, if they go after Taiwan, we won't defend it. If, if they decide from China that they will invade Taiwan, what will we do? If the North Koreans decide they want to launch a nuclear weapon, what are we going to do? <clears throat> if the South China Sea is closed off to the Japanese and our allies look to us, do we have the resources and the strength to do it? And regrettably, the answer is maybe not. So I just call on everybody who watches this program, you better pray for this nation because your lives may be at stake. Now, turning to the Middle East, on top of all this, Israel, the Israelis are voting again today for the fourth time in two years. And joining us now from Jerusalem on more in the elections is our Middle East Bureau Chief, Chris Mitchell. Chris, uh, we are seeing the Iranian threat as a major issue in this election, or is that not the, the major issue? <clears throat> well, I should say right now, Pat, I think there's three main issues, certainly COVID, the economy, but certainly Iran, and Iran actually plays to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's strength. He is kind of leading in the polls right now, just barely possibly uh, putting together a coalition government. He's been the one that's been standing up to Iran, uh, certainly uh, Iran's influence in Syria. And add to the mix, uh, Turkey, and uh, you, you hear all these threats around the region. And a lot of Israelis right now want change. Uh, you know, there's sort of this anybody but Bibi. He's been in office nearly 12 years. But the question a lot of Israelis have to ask right now, do you want to change the leadership right now with all these threats? Iran attacked an Israeli ship last month. And, uh, so, and then the U.S., speaking of uh, weakness, may re-enter the nuclear deal. And uh, so his experience right, right now may be a major factor today in these elections. We'll know more later. Uh, Chris, uh, let me ask you, uh, uh, I asked before this, I'll ask you again, did, do you have any feeling, any, any prognostication? It looks like the Likud will, will come out as the winner in the parliamentary election. Am I right there? I would say so. Certainly, they're going to be the major uh, party. I mean, in all of the polls, they're leading by maybe 10 seats or more. Uh, but I would say right now my prognostication uh, would be that maybe they can squeak out uh, the ability to have a narrow coalition. The magic number, Pat, we've talked about this before, is 61 seats. Uh, right now, uh, it, uh, maybe a week or so ago, they were hovering around 58 or 59 seats. The latest trend is that maybe he can get to 61 seats, meaning that he can put together a coalition together of right-wing uh, parties without having to count on any of the left 
wing parties. Uh, one key factor has been the, uh, the Arab vote. Is, uh, is that is very important. And uh, he's been courting the Arab vote. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's a very important uh, part. And so if, if I would say anything, Pat, you know, maybe by next, next week we'll know a lot clearer. We'll have the exit polls tonight. But, uh, but we'll see what's going to happen. Uh, uh, but I would give the edge right now to Netanyahu. And, Pat, I want to remind you that the plo polls close right now at 10 p.m. Israel time. And we're going to be providing live coverage of today's historic election and analysis when the exit polls uh, are revealing. That'll be at 10 p.m. That'll be at 4 p.m. East Coast time across the CBN news platforms. And we're going to have Danny Danone. He's Israel's former U.S. Amb U.N. ambassador. And we're going to have John Waggy, who's been covering Israeli elections almost as long as U.S. elections. <laughs> well, Chris, thanks for that and your prognostications. Well, folks, in another uh, news, a blatant power grab. That's what Republicans are calling the push to make Washington, D.C. the 51st state. Now, can the Democrats pull this off? John Jessup has more. Thank you, Pat. Republicans and Democrats clashed over Was whether Washington, D.C. should become the 51st state. It is a political battle that's been brewing for decades, gaining momentum in recent years. CBN's Jenna Browder explains how D.C. statehood could tilt the nation's balance of power. Taxation without representation. That's what D.C. license plates famously read. And now with some renewed enthusiasm, Democrats are hoping to change that by making D.C. its own state. In taxation without representation and pass H.R. 51. Monday, members of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee held a hearing to examine the issue. Should Washington, D.C. be its own state? After years of stagnation and indifference to the rights of thousands of D.C. residents, there is real and sustained momentum behind this effort. Once seen as a far-left idea, D.C. statehood is now supported by almost all Democrats. And with control of the House, Senate, and White House, this could be their time. The same bill fell flat in 2020. Is there a constitutional reason that the nation's capital is not a state? Yes, absolutely. There are several constitutional reasons why Congress cannot, by simple legislation, transform the District of Columbia into our nation's 51st state. Zach Smith with the Heritage Foundation testified at the hearing. There's the issue of the 23rd Amendment, uh, which gave the district uh, electoral college votes for president and vice president. Uh, that should certainly be repealed before D.C. becomes a, a state. Uh, and then there's also the issue, you know, we hear a lot, 37 times previously in our history, states have been admitted by simple legislation. Well, that's true, but no other state owes its very existence to a separate provision of the Constitution, which the district does. Meanwhile, Republicans see the effort as a blatant power grab. Let's be very clear. Today's hearing is all about creating two new Democratic U.S. Senate seats. Since D.C. consistently supports the Democratic nominee for president, statehood would tilt the balance of power in the Senate to Democrats. And that's why Republicans want to keep it neutral, independent of any state. It's our duty as representatives for all Americans that we safeguard their capital. And even if this bill passes the House, it faces an uphill battle in the Senate because of the filibuster rule, which requires 60 votes for passage. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thank you, Jenna. To make your voice heard on the issue, you can go to CBNFaithInAction.com and sign the online petition. Pat? You look back at the history of America, uh, apparently uh, the northern states with Alexander Hamilton wanted uh, a capital someplace near Philadelphia or in the north. And Thomas Jefferson, representing Virginia and the southern states, wanted it someplace in the south. And so they were walking together in Washington one evening, and they said, look, uh, Jefferson said to Hamilton, look, we'll, we'll make a compromise, and we'll set up this territory uh, on the edge of Virginia going north, and this will be our capital, and it's called the District of Columbia, and that's where the D.C. comes from. And it was an agreement between these two gentlemen to have a separate thing. Now, the state, the, the, the name of the city there is Washington. 
So it's Washington, D.C., <clears throat> Washington <clears throat> in the District of Columbia. And it goes against history. <clears throat> it was never intended uh, in those early negotiations that this should be another state. <clears throat> it was a compromise, a small territory that would allow the capital of the United States to be not too far to the north and not too far to the south, but in the middle. That's what it's all about. And the idea of making that thing a state, giving two more senators to them, and then the next thing would be Puerto Rico making that a state and getting two more senators. So now you'd have four senators and you would flip the balance of the Senate forever. And it's just not something that ought to be done. John. Pat, turning to the White House, where the Biden administration reportedly is putting together a multi-layered infrastructure and economic package, the potential price tag, $3 trillion. The first part, a plan to rebuild roads, bridges, and other infrastructure that includes climate change in line with campaign pledges. The follow-up, education and other priorities, such as expanding the child tax credit, universal pre-kindergarten, and tuition-free community college. Aides will be briefing the president this week before he signs off on the plan. Well, Colorado officials still are seeking a motive in the shooting that left 10 people dead in a Boulder grocery store Monday. The suspect is in custody. The shooting started in the parking lot of the King Supers before the suspect went inside. Dozens in the store ran for their lives, taking cover. One shopper described himself, quote, as a sitting duck. About an hour later, police emerged with a bloody shirtless man in handcuffs. The officer who died, Eric Talley, was an 11-year veteran of the Boulder, Boulder Police Department. Officer Talley was the father of seven. Well, questions now about research backing the AstraZeneca vaccine this morning. An independent monitoring board telling U.S. health officials the company may have included outdated information from its trial. The National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases is urging the company to review its data and make available the most accurate and timely data on effectiveness as soon as possible. Well, as the pandemic marched across America early last year, much of the nation shut down, including schools and sports activities. The result? A mental health crisis among children. CBN's Charlene Aaron shows us how one group is enlisting churches to help kids in their communities re-engage. From disorganized virtual learning to no activities like proms and after-school sports, COVID-19 has disrupted basic rights of life for this young generation, leaving many with mental and behavioral issues that could linger well after the virus is gone. I think about the price so many of my grandkids and your kids are going to pay for not having had the chance to finish whatever it was. That graduation where you didn't get to walk across the stage, I think they're going through a lot, these kids. The president isn't alone in that assessment. It's awful and it's universal. There's an increased incidence of anxiety disorders, depression, suicidal ideation. Kids often don't know how to manage the anxiety that they feel. An impact psychiatrist, Dr. Daniel Amen, says isn't going away anytime soon. We're going to feel the reverberation of the pandemic for at least a generation of uh, children and teenagers. Lockdowns and social restrictions have basically crippled many youth sports organizations, leaving activities in some states canceled for the past 10 months. While some youth sports are finally starting back up, a new study reveals three out of 10 kids won't be returning to the lineup. The difficulty has been there. We know that when kids are playing video games at home uh, instead of out exercising and interacting with other kids, it's, it can be detrimental to their health. The group Upward Sports helps local churches set up sports leagues in their communities. Executive Director Kevin Drake told CBN's Prayer Link how sports often serve as a physical and emotional outlet. Kids need structure, and we know that when kids are together and in organized sports, that it brings that discipline and structure for them. Drake emphasizes a key part of the equipment list. Our number one goal is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with people who need it. And so 
uh, you put the, the, the power of sharing the gospel with the ability for churches to partner in their communities to bring kids back together for sports. Meanwhile, with COVID vaccinations happening across the country, President Biden is pushing to reopen public schools in the next few months. Yet, like with much of the pandemic, it is unclear when youth sports or anything else will return to normal. Charlene Aaron, CBN News. Thanks, Charlene and Pat. Many hoping and expecting a return to normal soon. Well, they talk about normal, whatever it is. We'd love to see it. But I tell you, the, the, the reaction to this COVID thing has been worse than the COVID. COVID is bad. But the truth is, we probably kill more people on the highways every year than have died from COVID. But that's, that's not the thing. We're not shutting down automobiles or vehicles, but we shut the whole economy down. It was a tragic blunder. And what needs to be done, and they should have done, was to isolate the uh, vulnerable population, whether it's the elderly or people with pre-existing conditions or whatever it is, to, to isolate them and let everybody else go free. Instead of that, state after state have shut the, their, their economies down and it's ruining them. Especially, look, you look what's happening in New York, you look what's happening in California particularly, it's just been horrible. But what it's doing to the children has been uh, catastrophic and to close classes and not have uh, uh, classrooms for children. I mean, we may be sacrificing a whole generation because of the overreaction to something that shouldn't be that way. Sure, COVID is horrible. Yes, people have died from it. Yes, it is a terrible, terrible disease. But the way to deal with it is different from what they've been doing and you don't lock the uh, society down. Uh, the governor of DeSantis in Florida has shown the way, and we salute him for what he has done. And uh, they have have got the answer. And I guess he's probably being looked upon as a potential Republican uh, nominee for president because of the work he's done in Florida, vis-a-vis -vis what's being done by the governor subject to recall in California. Big tech crackdowns. Social media giants are shutting out conservatives and Christians, shattering their right to free speech and killing their contributions. So will they be coming after you next? Paul Strand has the answer. For decades, LifeSite News has covered family abortion culture with no issues on the web and social media, piling up millions of clicks and views. We've been, you know, operating normally forever and ever. Our YouTube channel had uh, 315,000 subscribers. Um, regular, we had millions of video views a week, every week. That's now falling to pieces as big tech cracks down on LifeSite News. After giving it three clear warnings, YouTube completely banned it in February for a COVID-related video featuring a Catholic bishop. All he said was that, uh, you know, he wasn't going to take uh, this COVID vaccine because it was abortion tainted. YouTube guidelines state YouTube doesn't allow content that spreads medical misinformation that contradicts local health authorities or the World Health Organization's medical information about COVID-19. Google News has also booted LifeSite News. We had a lot of traffic from Google News. We're off there now, completely. No appeal process allowed. Views and clicks have fallen big time and so have donations. This has affected us in major, major ways. Um, losing an audience of 315,000 subscribers and literally millions of views per week is, is, is quite substantial. People shop and sell and go to church online. Dan Gaynor, from his position at TechWatch and the Media Research Center, sees deplatforming hurting tens of thousands. It harms their businesses. It harms churches and Christian groups who want to reach their, you, know, you build up an audience, and then suddenly it's just, you know, the rug is pulled out from under you and you can't reach your people. If we are not allowed online freedom, then we become third-class citizens in a society where everything is done online. The thing is, private internet companies aren't bound by the First Amendment, and they're usually covered by immunity from something called Section 230 of the Federal Telecommunications Act. Critics, though, are calling on the FCC and Congress to change that so that at least big tech could be sued if it's deplatforming and censoring hurts someone.
Meanwhile, it goes on, with Gaynor saying the deplatforming went hyper after the election, beginning with the big tech booting of Donald Trump. President Donald Trump was removed from 17 different platforms. They concluded that if they can do it to Trump, they can do it to all of us. Gaynor's conclusion? Systematically, big tech is turning technology into a club to be used against people who dare disagree with them. Google denies this, saying in a 2018 media statement, giving preference to content of one political ideology over another would fundamentally conflict with our goal of providing services that work for everyone. Gaynor disagrees, and he warns this cancel culture trend is moving from big tech to places like banks, credit card companies, and law firms cutting off conservatives. Gaynor and Weston advise these and other potential targets to build their own alternative infrastructure and systems. And that means web companies and lawyers and uh, search engines and social media companies and all of those links along the chain. But it's really, really important that people have these alternatives and make do the reach outs now to alternatives where you can get to. LifeSite News has learned a hard lesson. That YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, they really don't have the best interests of freedom at heart. They are going to come after you. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. Well, I'm not quite sure what we do about it, but I think uh, changing the law, that's Section 230, is should have been, you know, the, it, it was in the old days. They said, look, uh, we're a platform, we're a neutral platform, and therefore we, we should be given immunity if we put stuff on the on our platform that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be sued because somebody says something. That's fine unless they begin to, to manipulate the platform, at which time they should be subject to suit. And that particular section of the, of the Communications Act should be taken out. And I think there are a lot of people that want it because these big guys are exercising far, far, far too much control over the lives of people. Terry? Mowed down by a hit-and-run driver and left to die. That's what happened to Susan Cummings. So after her killer turned himself in, why did he want to meet with Susan's family? And what exactly happened behind closed doors? You're about to find out. She had come over for my daughter's birthday party. Um, before she left, I told her I loved her. And she said, you should come see me more often. <laughs> Susan Cummings was a loving mother to her children, a cherished sister, and an important member of her community. She had a heart to serve. Uh, she was a nurse. Um, she loved to help people. She made it a point to, to be at graduation parties and birthday parties, uh, even in her superhero costume, I like to call it, which was her, her scrubs. In the early morning hours of August 16th, 2015, Susan rode in a charity bike ride to raise money for water wells in Kenya. Her son Kenny learned there had been an accident involving his mom. I was actually preparing for a business trip. I was gonna get up early and head to the airport when I got a call. And so I, I answered the phone and it was my mom's best friend, Nancy. She goes, Kenny, your mom has been in a car accident. I go, is she okay? And she goes, no, she's, she, she died. She's, she's dead, and I'm so sorry. I couldn't believe it. I was in sh total shock. When you, when you get words like that, uh, it, it, it's just like a, a punch in the gut. When it set in and what had happened, the details of what had happened, that she was actually struck and killed by a hit-and-run driver, um, I was furious that someone would take not only a human life, it would take my mother from me and leave her there to die as if she was worthless. Soon after, a man named Ronnie Joe Claflin turned himself in. When Ronnie ultimately um, came forward, um, I was relieved to finally have a scapegoat for all the anger and frustration that I was dealing with and hurt to be able to put it on someone, be able to finally look at that person and, and really judge them for what they had done in my mind. Tom, a pastor, says he knew almost immediately he would have to forgive his sister's killer. 
The reason I was able to choose to forgive is uh, when I was 16, I was jumped uh, by five or six black guys that uh, stomped me and, and broke my nose and stole my bike and, and just left me there basically for dead. And in that moment, I had a, a feeling of racism that injured my heart. And it wasn't until I saw, I believe it was Rodney King getting beat down on national television that the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, it's not the color of a man's skin, but the spirit that drives him. And so in that moment, be before the television, I just said, God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. The family would eventually learn that Ronnie had been using inhalants the day of the accident. Ronnie's trial and sentencing was almost a year later. It would be the family's first interaction with the man who had killed Susan. Then, shortly before the trial, something unusual happened. Ronnie had chose to plead guilty and wanted to meet with us behind closed doors, which, by the way, never happens. Um, a lot of emotions were in the room that, that day. And, but before we, we began that meeting with Ronnie, before he entered the room, um, we prayed, and so we invited the Holy Spirit there, and then and Ronnie and, and the prosecuting attorney and, and the defense attorney walked in through the door, and uh, Ronnie was already uh, tearful, um, already remorseful, and uh, there was a lot of crying in the room, and as you can imagine, um, we were finally seeing this man for the first time. I asked Ronnie, I said, Ronnie, are you sorry for what you did? And of course, at that moment, Ronnie said, I, I, I do, I, I'm sorry. But each of my family members, including uh, Susan's boyfriend, Roddy, um, all said, I forgive you. At the trial, most of the family members were there and shared their forgiveness publicly. We all prepared a statement of mercy. We all read through and confirmed to the court and to the judge that we had forgiven Ronnie and that we sought mercy for him on his behalf. Grace showed up in that courtroom. Even the judge said, in all my 20 years, I have never seen this happen in my courtroom. In 2016, contributions poured in for the Kenyon Waterwell project that Susan had given her life for. I was invited to go to Kenya to dedicate a water well in Susan's honor. It was so overwhelming to go to a, a place on the other side of the, the globe and, and hear my sister being heralded as a hero. I, I, I just can't begin to put into words what I was experiencing and we were hearing them uh, singing joys uh, about my sister. Tom says he hopes the grace their family showed to Ronnie will help others see the power of forgiveness. Jesus tells us to forgive. He said, if you forgive, then I'll forgive. If you don't forgive, then I won't forgive. It, it's so powerful to think that Jesus, while hanging on the cross, and he looked down at them and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We think we're holding our offender in prison, but it's actually us. We're holding ourselves hostage. But when we say, I choose, I choose, I choose to forgive, and we choose to forgive, we again faith it until we make it. We begin to say, I forgive, until that feeling becomes a reality. It's powerful, isn't it? Grace showed up 2,000 years ago at the cross, and grace is still showing up in situations like the one you just saw. Tom said grace showed up in, in that meeting that day when they met the killer of his sister. You know, God's plan is so big, it's so huge. When God says, if you forgive, I'll forgive you, but if you don't forgive, I won't forgive you. It's not because God is stamping his foot because you're not doing what he's asked you to do. It's because he wants you to understand the power of forgiveness. He wants you to understand that forgiveness sets you free. It's the thing that lets you fly again, that lets you live again, that lets you breathe again, that lets you hear his voice again. When you harbor bitterness or resentment 
against anyone, you become the victim of that. And you know, the hard part about forgiveness is sometimes it seems so irrational to forgive. It seems like you're letting the other person off the hook or like you don't care about what it is they did that was so devastating. The truth is forgiveness doesn't have to be received by the person you extended to, but it does have to be offered by you and by me so that we can be set free from anger and resentment and the chains that come with that. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. You can't have it abundantly if you're chained to some wrong that someone has done to you. You know, choice is involved in every single decision we make every single day. And obedience to what Jesus says is one of those choices, you know? He's not saying, if you think this is a good idea, he's not even asking us, you know, what we think about how he does things. He's saying, this is the way it works because he's the creator. He's the one who made you. He made me. He understands how we tick inside. He understands what full freedom in life is. And he understands what lack of forgiveness will do in our hearts and in our minds. So today, I want to invite you, if you are someone who has struggled with this, with someone who has done you wrong, whether it's big or small, you need to let go of it. You need to let go of it, first of all, to be obedient to the God that you say you love and serve, and second, to receive the freedom and the peace that God wants to give you when you make the right choice. So what are you gonna to do today? You know, we can talk about Jesus, we can have head knowledge about him, we can say that we're Christians, but the proof's in the pudding, isn't it? I mean, how are you living? Are you living according to his word? Or are you letting your own feelings, your own emotions, your own bitterness run your life? Life is short. Don't make decisions that make your life less than anything you were created to be and to have. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Ask him even to give you the capacity to forgive. It's his decision. It's his choice for you to do that. He'll help you. Do what they did in that room. Pray, Holy Spirit, come into my heart and my life. Teach me your ways. Help me to be obedient and to follow your leading. And if you'd like to know more about forgiveness, the why behind it, the scripture behind it, we have a, a great little brochure here, a little packet that we'd like to give to you. And it answers a lot of your questions. And so if you'd like to have this, uh, you can download your free copy by going to CBN.com, but you can also call to get it. You know our number, it's 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I'd like the information on forgiveness and we'll send it out to you right away. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Mississippi Governor Tate Reeves has signed the Down Syndrome Information Act, known as Hudson's Law. It's named after a toddler with Down Syndrome. The new law requires doctors to provide educational information to parents whose children are newly diagnosed with a genetic disorder. Sue Liebel with the pro-life Susan B. Anthony List says, quote, Parents deserve to know that 99% of people with Down Syndrome live happy and fulfilled lives no child should be deprived of the right to be born, especially due to a disability. This is no less than modern day eugenics. Well, a new book, Secular Surge, by three political scientists argues the mixing of conservative politics and religion has resulted in the rise of nuns or people with no religious affiliation. Pew Research shows a 12 percentage point decline in Americans who identify as Christians compared to a decade earlier. 65% of Americans currently identify as Christian, while those who identify as religiously unaffiliated are at 26%. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Hard to believe, but Easter is right around the corner. And the CBN Family app has special features for you and your family to enjoy throughout this season. You can partake in a virtual communion service with Pat. You can hear special Easter teachings from Gordon and learn how to make carrot cake with Wendy. 
you don't want to miss this special time of celebration. All you have to do is download the CBN Family app to your smart device or go to CBNFamily.com to enjoy all of these exclusive features and much, much more. Pat? Well, I've got a story for you now. More clothes, more jewelry, bigger house, better cars. David and Chris Helms through thought credit was great. They bought whatever they wanted until the day, the day came they could no longer make the minimum payments. So what happened when they needed a six-figure miracle? Here you've got it. Chris and David Helm have many joyful memories from their 40-year marriage, but they'll never forget the sleepless nights they spent worrying about money. Well, you go to bed thinking about the bills you owe and how are you going to make the money to pay those bills. We had no backup plan. There was no plan B ever, except fear. When Chris and Dave married, they were both employed. She was an insurance underwriter and he worked in sales on commission. But they spent all the money they earned and more. To me, you had arrived when you could have more, when you could have more clothes, have jewelry, have anything that made you look good. It was definitely an insecurity issue on my part. We did not have a, a, a budget, really. We just sort of shot from the hip. When Chris quit her job to become a stay-at-home mom, they put the deficit on credit cards. Credit was, was great. It was an outstanding way to get what we needed or wanted with no consequences that I saw. But there were consequences. The couple accumulated $17,000 in credit card debt and couldn't make the monthly minimum payments. Chris handled the bills and received the calls from creditors. It is harassment, but it was my debt. I owed it, and you have to pay your debts. We had no backup plan that if one thing went wrong, if he got sick, if we needed a car repair, you knew it was another payment just added to the stack of bills that were already sitting there. And I felt like a failure too. As a man, I was just trying to become more successful and it just wasn't happening. By the end of 2001, the Helms' financial strain had escalated into a crisis. A lucrative project that David expected suddenly fell through, along with the commission the couple was counting on to pay huge year-end expenses. We needed a lot of money. We had a $60,000 tax bill due and one child in college. We needed six figures. Well, we were terrified. We just didn't know where the money was coming from. So the Helms turned to God in prayer. They were Christians who knew about tithing in theory, but not in practice. It never occurred to me that because we weren't giving or tithing, that we were actually robbing God of the opportunity to bless us. I remember saying, Lord, I have not been faithful. I promise you not one more dime will ever come in this house that I will not give to you if you will just take care of this for us. And she brought it to me, and it was like, we need to be doing this. The Holy Spirit just united us on that. Just two months after making their initial tithe, the couple was astounded by what happened. The project that had been canceled was reinstated, followed closely by two more lucrative projects. The Lord not only gave us all of that money that we needed, He also gave us $2,000 extra, and He showed me His faithfulness. Since then, the Helms' income has tripled their debts are paid in full, and they're saving for the future. They remain generous givers, and one of their favorite places to give is to CBN. I see the work that they do helping the home front. Oh my gosh, I, I just want to reach through the TV and hug our military people and thank them for what they do. I think for me, the Operation Blessing is something I can't necessarily go, but you can send money. That makes me feel like we are an extension of that. He says, those who give to the poor, lend to him. If you can't see where it's going to come from, don't let that distract you or, dis or keep you from being obedient to the Lord. The Bible says it pleases him to give us good things. You know, you look at Malachi, you know, given it shall be given unto you, pressed down good measure. But the scriptures are all there. When I started living them, it changed my world. It changed my life. Hey, that's a pretty good testimony of the Helms. You know, but God is on the, the line for that one. Prove me. You know, we're not supposed to tempt God. That's a sin to tempt God. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's what 
Jesus told the devil. But there's one time that we're supposed to test God, and that was tithes and offerings. He said, prove me if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing you can't contain it. That's what he said in Malachi, and that's what is there. And the Helms found it to be true. So I, I just urge you, uh, you know, to enjoy the goodness of God. You know, the Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, it's more blessed because when you give, you do begin to receive. Press down, good measure, running over, will men heap into your bosom. So the Helms have enjoyed uh, their relationship with CBN, and we enjoy having them as our friends and partners. And you can join the 700 Club and be part of the family. And uh, whatever your uh, commitment is, your tithes and offerings, whether it's 10%, whether it's 50%, whether it, whatever the amount, but the 700 Club is $20 a month. Some of you can do $100 a month. Some of you can do $1,000. There are all kinds of things you can do. But the big thing is get started. And I just ask you to pick up the telephone and call in so you can count on me. And we'd love to have you as part of our family of, of um, partners and associates and friends who are making all this ministry possible. And we have something that I want to give to you. Uh, my book, I Walk with the Living God, uh, has uh, it's brutally honest. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, a recitation of some of the miracles that have taken place in my life. It has in here six pages of wonderful pictures, including here's one with me and Billy Graham. Here's one with me and Colin Power. Uh, here's, uh, uh, you know, pictures of uh, me with B.B. Netanyahu over in Israel and others. Uh, we'll give this to you free as you join the 700 Club. I walk with the living God. I want you to have a copy of that. But more than anything, I want you to have the blessing of being a partner with CBN and to have the same blessing the Helms had, 1-800-700-7000. Terry. Hey, this is Clarita. She yeah. lives in Bethlehem, Georgia. She's read your book. She All says, right. Dr. Pat Robertson's book, I Have Walked with the Living God, is one of the best books I've read in my lifetime. It not only narrates the incredible journey of his personal life, but also how he obtained godly wisdom and blessings from his Savior. What God has done for him, he will do for us as long as we diligently seek him, which gives hope to all. Wow, that's a great... Clarita, I appreciate yes. that. God bless you. You know, I just uh, asked the Lord to give me something, and, and I, I, it just began to flow, and I began to share yeah. all the times when God has uh, given us victory over satanic um, uh, bondage, how we have seen His blessing, how He's led us to start various programs. I think you'll find this very interesting. I do, too. All right. Well, it's time for your questions and Pat's answers. Pat, this first one comes from Brian, who says, Hi, I was wondering if it's okay to be a fan of WWE Pro Wrestling, or is it against the Bible? I also have a hobby of collecting the WWE merchandise. Uh, I tell you, uh, two things. First of all, you remember there was a wrestling match in the Bible where uh, Jacob was wrestling with an <laughs> angel, so uh, wrestling apparently is biblical. But I'll tell you a story. I was, I was in a restaurant down in, in uh, Texas, down in Dallas, in, in a hotel, and I was sitting there uh, having lunch with one of the Von Erich family, and they were pro wrestlers. Okay. Wow. So I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm on television, and everybody should know who I am. And all of a sudden, a stream of these <laughs> Mexicans started coming out of the kitchen. They didn't care about me. All they wanted to do was talk get to that, pro, that, that pro wrestler. <laughs> they wanted to get his autograph. I mean, they literally lined up. And when we were over in Israel, they loved the wrestling. They, I mean, that was the big thing that we had when we had Middle East television was the wrestling. And then we got women's mud wrestling, and they just thought it was the most wonderful thing. And we thought we put it on by mistake. <laughs> but <laughs> apparently, it's a big deal. So wow. you know, I don't think it's any things sinful, but, you know, let's face it, the WWE, it's all a show. Mm. It really is a show. They train those guys how to do that stuff. Otherwise, they'd kill themselves. Yeah. So they're trained, and they, they and so it, it's a rehearsed show, 
And uh, but if you like a show, it's, there's nothing sinful about it, as I can tell. All right. This is Yvette, who says, First Samuel 16:14 says, "Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him." My question: How could a spirit from the Lord be harmful? Um, you know, I've read that, and I've had the same problem you have. Um, I just think that they they attributed everything having to do with spirits, both evil and good, to, to uh, Almighty God, to, to J J Yahweh. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think they were acknowledging the fact that these demon spirits would also come from Satan. But they, they said uh, uh, an evil spirit from the Lord came. Uh, it's in there, and I, I've had the same uh, burden as you have, but I, that's the only uh, question I can give you. Mm -hmm. <coughs> this is James who said, Pat, last Tuesday you mentioned a tax called a wealth tax, I think. Could you elaborate on this? It sounded extremely unfair to the hardworking citizens of our country. Well, uh, look, it, it is unfair. You know, the thing of it is it punishes success, and that's what these liberals want to do. They don't want anybody getting ahead. That's that's what it is. So is it unfair? Of course it's unfair. But they, that's what they nevertheless want to do. One last question. Graham wants to know, why does God always punish me? Uh, I don't think he does. I think you're asking for trouble. I, I think, you, you know, you ought to start the day off saying, this is the day the Lord hath made, and I rejoice and be glad. And if you start the day saying, woe is me, uh, for I feel so terrible, you're commanding yourself to feel terrible. So I think you're bringing your own problem on yourself. Confess joy and watch what happens. Confess victory. Well, our power minute is from Joshua. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. we we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. His story has inspired the world for thousands of years. Israel's most famous king. Well, some scholars doubted his very existence. You cannot claim that King David is a mythological figure. Journey deep beneath the ancient city of Jerusalem and see proof of Israel's celebrated hero. Get written in stone, House of David. Join host Gordon Robertson on an expedition through the evidence supporting the Old Testament. Extraordinary discoveries made headlines around the world. See where the shepherd boy slew the mighty giant. We are sharing some light on the story of David and Goliath. Explore the relics of the Davidic age. There was a significant structure standing here. And discover proof of King David's legacy. This is a royal house. Written in stone, House of David can be yours for any dollar amount. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com. Available now. Thank you.